Good evening and welcome to Perth Machine Learning Group. Tonight's speaker is Kevin Young and he'll be talking about graph neural networks at scale. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm based in Sydney here and it's my first time uh, joining the Perth Machine Learning Group. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, today, so I'm, as Sean mentioned, I'm going to be talking about graph neural networks, specifically around scaling them. Uh, and my aim for today's talk is uh, to try and give everyone here a bit of an understanding of some of the challenges, uh, specifically around scalability involved in bringing graph machine learning techniques to a production environment, and also give a bit of an overview of some of these algorithms that do try and tackle scalability head on. Uh, so before we get into the, all the graphs and all, I thought I might start off just by just with a bit of an introduction uh, about myself. So I previously worked on a project called Stellagraph at Cyrus Data 61 as a software engineer, where I was part of a team building a platform for graph analytics. Uh, so as you can, so the aim of the project was to provide a platform to bring uh, analytics capability for government agencies. And uh, the main focus of my role in the team was to discuss with researchers and data scientists on the team about various uh, like new graph-based methods that are coming up and hopefully identify and build uh, particular models that we saw were likely to be production ready. So as you can imagine, I did spend a lot of time studying the implementation details of algorithms and what implications they had in terms of scalability. So, and after three years on that project, now I've actually uh, switched to something completely different since June, earlier this year, actually. So I was lucky enough to have a little brother who's had some freelancing experience as a web developer. So uh, yeah, since middle of this year, I decided to take some time off from, you know, quote unquote, unquote normal job and um, take the opportunity to work on some small, fun uh, web development projects with him, as well as working on uh, also our own pet project at least until the end of this year, it seems like at the moment. Uh, so with that all said, so when Sean reached out to me about giving a talk here, yeah, I thought it was a really good opportunity for me to uh, just read up on the sort of material that I used to work on and some of the problems uh, I used to solve and start talking about it to people again. Uh, just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. I'll first start off with an introduction to graphs and graph neural networks and how they work. Uh, following on from that, I'll go into more detail about, uh, I guess, probably the most influential work in the field of graph machine learning called graph convolutional networks. You could argue that many other other algorithms that have come up since then uh, are variants of this initially proposed method. Uh, so my aim here would be to give everyone an intuition for how this algorithm works so that the material to follow uh, hopefully will make more sense. After that, I'll discuss a little bit about some of the specific challenges in scaling or scaling out graph-based methods. And last, but not least, I'll give some examples of techniques or algorithms that try to tackle the scalability problem. So let's start off with an introduction to graphs and graph neural networks. So starting pretty basic. So I thought I'd leave with some examples of data in the real world that are often represented as a graph. Uh, on the left here is an example of a social network 
where you have users of a social media platform like Facebook as nodes in the graph and connections between users as edges. Uh, in the middle here is a transaction network for the Bitcoin blockchain where you have edges to and from Bitcoin addresses representing coins uh, leaving and entering the address. And lastly, on the right here, we have a transportation network where nodes in the graph represent physical locations and edges are showing air traffic between locations. So I guess the point I was making here was just that graphs are just a way of representing data and uh, useful for looking at data points, uh, not, so, not in isolation, but in the context of other data points that are connected to it. Uh, it's also often quite useful to think about a graph in terms of its adjacency matrix. I'm sure many of you are already quite familiar with what an adjacency matrix is, but I guess for just for those who are new, basically a non-zero value in an adjacency matrix indicates that there is an edge connecting the corresponding pair of nodes at those coordinates. Uh, many graph-based methods operate on the adjacency matrix uh, of a graph. So having an intuition for how mathematical operations on the adjacency matrix relate, how that relates to what's actually happening on the graph, uh, I thought well, can be very helpful in understanding or having an intuition for what an algorithm is doing. Uh, so then what about graph machine learning. Uh, so firstly is a very simplified example of how you might consider a, let's say traditional machine learning model operates on a data set. Uh, data points are people in this case, and as well as uh, any features associated with them. And we're interested in knowing whether they like sci-fi movies. What we would typically see is that the model will take the features of any given person, in this case Charlie, and be able to make a prediction based on his or her features. Uh, but what graph-based methods allow us to do is to actually represent the data as a graph and use this graph representation as inputs to the model. And in this way, this enables a model to look at each data point in the context of its neighborhood before deciding what the prediction should be. So we would hope for it to be able to make more accurate predictions. Uh, graph-based models can also be designed to answer graph-based questions. So instead of predicting a label for a node, uh, we might be interested in predicting connections in the graph that are not present in the original data set. So I've just illustrated this example here. The model could be used to provide a prediction for whether Charlie could also be friends with Bob. So why is this useful? Well, what it does is it allows us to throw out the assumption of independence between data points. Like, uh, like the examples of data, graph data that we saw earlier, uh, in many real world, real world data sets, uh, entities in the data do have relations between one another and can naturally be represented as a graph. So there is this like information of connections that we can take advantage of. And if we didn't want to lose this information from the connections in the data, I guess alternatively, we could try to do some kind of hands-on feature engineering to encode whatever information we think uh, would be useful for each instance of the data. But I guess in comparison, you could say that graph machine learning methods provide us uh, like a more natural way to use graph representation as inputs uh, to machine learning models and allows us to kind of skip this 
uh, manual feature engineering process. So that was a bit of an introduction into graphs and now we're going to how graph convolutional networks work. Uh, so yeah, whenever I um, explain graph convolution, I tend to like to explain by starting with the concept of image convolution. So when we have a convolutional neural network where the goal is to find a representation for an image. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with CNNs, we perform convolution on a group of neighboring pixel values so that we can represent this patch of pixels with a single value. And really, if uh, you could, I guess, if you squint hard enough, you could say, this can actually just be seen as some form of regular graph where each node at the center has exactly uh, eight neighbors. And this is a principle we follow in generalizing convolutional neural nets to graph convolutional networks. So then generalizing this uh, so that neighbors aren't defined by location in a grid of pixels, but are instead defined by the existence of edges, uh, we can obtain something that looks more like graph convolution. And similar to image convolution, we can apply this technique recursively to aggregate the features of neighboring pixels uh, many hops of neighborhood away and use the final representation we obtain for whatever downstream prediction tasks that we're interested in solving. So then this neighborhood convolution operation uh, can actually be represented mathematically in in a pretty elegant way, just as a matrix multiplication of the nodes features with the adjacency matrix. Uh, and the exact way in which the neighborhood information is uh, transformed into an encoding of the target nodes representation is learned using the, the addition of the trainable weight matrix that we are learning. So this is I guess, yeah, the forward pass of one layer of graph convolutional networks. And doing this operation once, you can obtain no representations that incorporate uh, the information from neighboring nodes that are just one hop away and are recursively repeating this operation for some number of layers uh, is equivalent to expanding this neighborhood of influence. Uh, now I'll move on to some of the challenges that we faced from trying to apply graph machine learning techniques at scale. Uh, many of these are actually problems that we can't really say we got around to having a clear answer for, uh, but are useful questions, I think, to consider regardless when looking into you know, which particular algorithms might be good candidates for bringing into production. So typically when we talk about doing anything at scale, we, and I say we as in uh, data engineers and software engineers, look towards uh, horizontal scaling. Uh, we think of technologies like Spark or Flink uh, that lets us process large amounts of data in parallel. Uh, and lets us work with changing um, sizes of data or changing workloads. And we try to come up with strategies to avoid data shuffling since this, since this is usually the most expensive uh, operation to be doing in the pipeline. And in the case of traditional machine learning, a machine learning model fits into this uh, pipeline without too much 
friction. So usually as far as the model is concerned, it doesn't really care how, it doesn't um, need to look at the entire data set at once. It usually just takes one data point and spits out one prediction. But in the case for something like graph convolutional networks, the prediction of a single node in, isn't made just using the features of that node in isolation, but it's also made based on uh, the wider neighborhood information of this node. So then if we are interested in distributing our data, um, how do we make sure we can retrieve this neighborhood information when our data is spread across the cluster of machines? Is it, I guess we have to ask, is it possible to make sure that for every node, all of the nodes, neighboring nodes, uh, is it possible to make sure that all of the nodes, neighboring nodes are co-located on the same machine? And usually the answer would be no. Um, the graph cannot be partitioned perfectly into you know, the cluster of machines that you have. Uh, so then we end up having to perform some expensive data shuffles as needed. But then I guess even if we could shuffle the data as needed, uh, I'd say during prediction time, uh, can we even guarantee that the result of um, result of an operation, a shuffle operation, trying to contain all the neighborhood information of a node will actually fit on one machine and not cause uh, out of memory errors uh, on any machine. And the answer to this is that in many real life scenarios or uh, graphs in the real world, a uh, graph's edge distribution is observed to follow the power law, uh, which means that a very few subset of the nodes will be connected to a very large portion of the graph. Uh, and we sometimes call these, this subset of nodes, the super nodes. Uh, so if our graph does follow the power law, it's probably, it's highly unlikely that uh, trying to obtain the neighborhood information for any of these super nodes is going to fit on one machine in our cluster. So then I guess we can ask, can we make a special case to deal with supernodes so that uh, we avoid these out of memory errors? And overall, uh, on the topic of graphs and distributed systems, I mean, given these issues, does it even make sense to marry graph machine learning with distributing computing frameworks at all? Uh, another question that would be useful to answer to uh, is whether graph methods allow incremental updates to the model with batches of nodes and edges from the graph. Uh, batching is often useful for scalability since this gives us a way to decouple the size of the machines required from the size of the full data set. And a somewhat related question to that is whether these methods require all nodes to be present during training. Uh, when our data is represented as a graph and we have new unseen nodes or edges presented to us, uh, unlike non-graph data, um, the introduction of these unseen nodes and edges has an impact on the entire graph structure itself. So then that begs the question, is a model trained on one graph still valid for another, given the fact that any new data points introduced will be changing the graph? And this is a problem that arises from the fact that uh, TCN as an algorithm is considered a transactive algorithm which means it learns to make predictions on unlabeled data on a fixed data set, as opposed to learning 
a as opposed to being an inductive algorithm whose uh, aim is to learn a universal more of a universal rule which takes the data as a basis to learn from and GCN is inherently transductive since if you can recall the equation for the forward pass of GCN from earlier the adjacency matrix of the input graph is actually being used to build a model itself and actually defines the dimensions of the model parameters. So then, uh, yes, almost by definition, it doesn't allow for the adjacency matrix to grow or change in any way. So those were the sorts of questions we were interested in answering. And now we'll look at some of the variants of GCN that have tried to tackle some of these issues. Uh, so we have just now covered the problems of bringing graph-based methods into the world of scalability and distributed computing environments. But uh, just firstly, we'll take a more concrete view of Here's a more concrete view of why the vanilla GCN doesn't address these problems. So first of all, the forward pass of the algorithm requires manipulating the entire adjacency matrix at once, which makes it difficult to parallelize across a cluster. Secondly, batching is unlikely to be very practical for GCN, since even if you grab the batch of nodes, um, Given any graph that follows the power law distribution of edges, uh, in most cases will be will actually end up requiring most of the nodes in the graph anyway once we've expanded our neighborhood uh, from those initial batch of nodes for anything beyond just a couple of pops of neighborhood expansion. And finally, the method is also inherently transductive and so it does not generalize for unseen data. And ideally, we'd want to find an inductive algorithm that can be used to make predictions on parts of the graph that were not seen during training. GraphSage is an algorithm that I personally spent a lot of time working with. The paper was called yeah, the, the title of the paper was Inductive Representation Learning on Large Graphs. Uh, so you can imagine we were pretty excited to find out more about this. And uh, at least from the papers that I have gone through, it was one of the first papers that we found that employed sampling as a core strategy to deal with large graphs. And also naturally supported a way to do batching or mini batching. Uh, and yeah, I guess we like this algorithm so much that we ended up even extending it for our own use case for heterogeneous graphs and named it in Sage. Uh, I won't go into the detail about heterogeneous graphs in this talk, but they're basically a graph that also contains different node and edge types where each type may have a different set of features that define them. Uh, and the core idea behind GraphSage is uh, that instead of using the entire adjacency matrix or aggregating all nodes in the nodes neighborhood, uh, instead what we do is for any given target node, we sample a fixed size neighborhood to aggregate uh, features from. So the example in this diagram here demonstrates sampling exactly two neighbors for the yellow target node. And since we're taking a fixed size neighborhood uh, for every node instead of all its neighbors, this actually makes it uh, much easier to batch the inputs since we actually know the exact size of the input and it will be exactly the number of nodes times the size of the neighborhood that we're sampling. Uh, 
And we can repeat this process for every node in the graph to form the rest of our batches. And uh, once we have these batches, they can be processed in parallel uh, without problem. And by removing the reliance on using the entire adjacency matrix, uh, this algorithm is inductive instead of transductive, which means once you've trained the model, we can use it to make predictions on unseen data. But uh, despite the initial enthusiasm that we had for this approach, I guess it turns it turned out that it wasn't uh, without problems at all. So one problem arises from the fact that we kind of failed to take into account the implement de implementation details around uh, efficient sampling of a fixed size neighborhood for each node of the graph. Like, so really in order for any process to sample from a node's neighborhood, uh, it essentially does still need to traverse through the neighborhood to do to do so. Uh, other than that, and also for every convolution layer in the neural network, we still need to repeat this neighborhood sampling for all the neighbors that we sampled from the previous layer too. So we are still suffering from the very high memory usage due to like this recursive neighborhood expansion happening. So even if we have very few nodes in our batch of nodes, we'll still get a, uh, a big, a big ego graph to work with for our model to like, go through. And it also turns out that sampling the neighborhood of uh, every node in the graph is not exactly a trivial task to parallelize across a cluster. Uh, due to just due to the fact that not all neighborhoods are equal or equally sized. Uh, just to make that more concrete, so if we assume that the graph data resembles a power law edge distribution, so that so there will be like a handful of nodes that are connected to disproportionately many other nodes in the graph compared to most other nodes, these so-called super nodes. So if you did try to naively parallelize this task um, of for every node to sample uh, a set of neighbors, um, what it results in is that it means that a lot of machines in the cluster will end up sitting idle while one or two are still busy sampling the neighborhood for like these few super nodes that you have in your graph. So, in the end, some process needs to look through every neighbor and decide which ones to sample. And this basically became the new bottleneck in the pipeline. I did briefly think about whether there might be, yeah, we considered some more like wilder ideas, like maybe there's a probabilistic approach to it that could give us some kind of efficient neighborhood sampling. Um, yeah, I guess we were, in, like taking inspiration from something like a bloom filter, I can be used to detect the existence of a value in a set. Um, but I still have no idea if that is a thing. And yeah, it's not something we ended up exploring too far. Uh, I will also note, just before I move on to the other algorithms, that I did became more aware of um, these more specific problems with this approach because I spent a lot of time uh, working on its implementation details, um, which I cannot say to the same extent uh, for the next two algorithms, uh, which do seem like they do address, they address some of these issues, uh, but I just definitely haven't spent as much time with them. So the next algorithm is fast ECN, is, which is another method that employs sampling for efficiency, but in a slightly different way. So for this algorithm, instead of recursively expanding the neighborhood of the node, uh, we always sample a set of 
a set of nodes from the full set of nodes in the graph, just using a sampling probability distribution. And it is in this probability distribution where part of the magic of this method lies, which is why this paper is called Fast Learning with GCN via Importance Sampling. And I've put the title of the paper on slide, so feel free to dig into the maths uh, further or deeper than I did. But the extent to which I have an intuition for it is that um, the distribution, it puts higher weighting on picking nodes that have more important connections, such that picking these nodes will result in a sample graph that is more representative of the original full graph. And this method stems from an interesting initial assumption made by the paper that the graph data, the full graph data that one might have is actually a sample of some kind of infinite graph that actually represents the world. So using this sampling uh, strategy, it's, it's supposed to be kind of like you're taking a further sample from the sample. Um, and although I didn't spend too much time on the implementation details of this approach, uh, I did find the paper an interesting read at the time. So to take you through the forward pass of this algorithm, so just looking at the diagram here, so we first take a batch of nodes that we want to train on or predict on. In this case, we have these three yellow nodes. Then we sample three other nodes using the important sampling approach that I mentioned earlier. So then with these six nodes, we basically perform convolution so that we're just aggregating information from the green sampled nodes uh, into the towards our yellow batch nodes. So this will be one, one layer of convolution. And then if you had more, you'd have another set of uh, three nodes that uh, perform, and you perform convolution so that it aggregates towards the, the original set of neighbors. So as you can imagine, um, some of these sampled nodes, like the green uh, one at the more at the top, uh, will not be directly connected to any of the batch nodes. So then they just naturally be, become ignored in the process. So this approach does appear to have some advantages over the approach in graph stage. So firstly, it, it avoids a recursive neighborhood expansion which causes the high memory usage that was problematic. Uh, secondly, we can, uh, yeah, I guess sampling from a full set of nodes does sound to me like something more, like something that we should be able to do more efficiently, more easily, uh, rather than having to sample from a node's neighborhood. But yeah, maybe I can't say this for sure since I didn't get around to actually implementing this. Uh, and the last point might kind of be both a negative and a positive, but what graph stage does um, is that it does actually force you to aggregate information from a fixed size neighborhood, no matter how dense your neighborhood is. Um, but this algorithm kind of has a way of naturally um, or reverting to a non-graph algorithm or naturally ignoring nodes that are not very well connected. So I would say that this paper, although it was interesting, I think definitely didn't see as much of the spotlight in the community of graph machine learning as GraphSage did. But yeah, I remember having read it, I did think it was worth trying out at some point. Uh, but before that amounted to um, much of an effort, another paper actually came out called Cluster GCN, uh, 
uh, which takes yet another approach to sampling that looked really promising too. And with this method, we actually begin by partitioning the graph into the you know, n distinct clusters of nodes using a any any clustering algorithm that maximizes within cluster links and minimizes links between clusters. And the the diagram on the left here is trying to illustrate like some kind of coarse view of a large adjacency matrix. So it looks like it's a five by five, but I guess imagine that there are smaller squares inside each of the bigger squares that so that each square is like a cluster of a hundred hundreds of nodes. Um, and I'm using basically using the darkness of the squares to indicate um, the density of edges that exist within or between each cluster. So the block diagonal kind of represents the, the within cluster links for each cluster, and anything outside of the block diagonal are links joining one cluster, uh, links joining nodes from one cluster to nodes in another cluster. Hopefully that's clear. Um, and so you can expect that after running a clustering algorithm, your adjacency matrix might look something like the one on the left here, where it approximates a block diagonal matrix, where most of the edges are found within the clusters. And there are only a few edges that connect those between clusters. And at this point, now we could just assume that this approximation is good enough and train the GCN in batches where each batch is a distinct cluster. But then we'll be throwing away the, I guess we'll be kind of just assuming that, it, that the graph is made up of these distinct clusters and no edges that join them. Uh, but cluster GCN actually uses a uh, Quite a clever trick to do slightly better. So instead of training on the clusters completely separately and ignoring the between cluster links altogether, uh, what we can actually do is train on multiple clusters, cluster between cluster links at a time uh, as a training batch. The diagram here that I've included is from the original paper and it's uh, illustrating what this might look like if we were training on training with two clusters at a time. So in this way, we're not only just using the block diagonal adjacency matrix, but we're, I guess you can almost say we're effectively sampling from the rest of the adjacency matrix too if we're picking two random clusters or three random clusters at a time. So this approach, this, this avoids sampling from neighborhoods or from a sampling distribution altogether. And uh, it did appear to me uh, as being pretty straightforward to implement. I guess one thing to take into account here though, is the fact that we do need to run a clustering algorithm before running, uh, before feeding the data into the neural network. So we'd also have to explore how to do this efficiently. But I would probably say that if I was still on a project working on scalable graph machine learning, um, cluster GCN would be up there for algorithms to be inspired by at least. So those are all the different approaches I wanted to discuss today. Uh, and now I'll just briefly touch on some final thoughts I have. So in the end, I think what all these techniques boil down to somewhat, is that they are trying to come up with clever approaches to effectively or efficiently sample a set of nodes and edges to train on from the full graph without introducing too much bias. I'm hearing people talking. Is that for 
Someone asking a question? Uh, I, think, I think that's someone talking downstairs. Hang on. Let me see if I can mute them. Sorry. Yeah, I think I've muted the right person. Um, yeah, just continuing. So, yeah, um, yeah, I was just saying that all these techniques somewhat boil down to, uh, you know, coming up with clever approaches to like sample from the full graph without introducing bias. And I've, I think I've given you some a bit of an overview of like the techniques that I thought were notable. And I guess we'll just have to see what other types of solutions come up in the future that might potentially be uh, more elegant, you could say. Uh, and the second thing I would also say is that graph machine learning still feels very new in the world of big data. And, um, I always felt that there isn't too much support for big graphs in from the sorts of technologies that a big data engineer might be used to. Uh, Spark, Spark technically does have support for graphs, but whenever I was doing any sort of graph operations on the graph using Spark, uh, it always felt like something that goes against the grain in the world of Spark, where it's you know minimizing shuffling and data skew is supposed to be really at its core. So yeah, that's all from me today. I hope uh, some people found something interesting from that. And yeah, feel free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Um, so, uh, can we maybe open it up to the floor? Do we have any questions? From folks? Um, hey, Kevin. Uh, really like the talk. Um, just had a question about this. Everything you said in relation to like the recent literature that's going on with transformers. Have you been looking into transformers much at all recently? Uh, no. Uh, I don't know what that is. Okay, sure. So <laughs> sorry. I can go into it. So um. Yeah, sure. Transformers are kind of like the recent hype train in a uh, language processing especially, and um, what they kind of do is they take a whole kind of a whole corpus of text or like, you know, like a whole sentence and they kind of, of words and they tokenize it and give it a representation. And effectively what they do is they calculate similarity measures between all words in the sentence at once. So effectively what you do is you get a representation of basically correlation between all words in a sentence at once. And so what this means is you kind of need to compare each word, so each word to every other word and itself to like say, this is my relationship to a different word in my sentence at the very end, at the beginning, adjacent ones, so on and so forth. And it does it all in parallel. And what this kind of leads to is this kind of mechanism that powers this model is an O squared quadrat uh, quadratic complexity. So that's a huge bottleneck in this model. Um, actually, was the explanation decent at all? You, is it okay? Uh, I'm not sure if I follow all of it, but basically some, it's a process that takes an entire corpus of words. Yeah. And then it has similarity measures between all pairs of words. Yes, exactly. Corpus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in that regard, if you think of that like a graph, you're basically to crack embedding or representation of one word, you need to take an entire run in the entire graph, if you think of. Yeah. And so what they're finding nowadays, all the literature in this field is like, hey man, these things are way too expensive. Let's find how we can um, quickly move away from that. So they go into how, they, they actually go into like convolutional operations on local, no, local neighborhoods or like random kind of yeah. attention between random words or random nodes in your graph. And I'm just seeing there's a lot of interplay between what you're saying and transformers have famously been kind of, even once upon a time were called graph neural networks. So 
I guess yeah. you can't, maybe you can't answer, but I think I was going to ask if you think there's any real interplay between the developments in this field and the developments being made in graph neural networks, especially because they're being combined a lot in practice for a lot of language based and like multi hop and type of representational problems. But it's all good. But I just found it interesting that to make sense. Yeah, I, w I wasn't uh, familiar with what transformers were, but uh, one algorithm that I didn't mention in this talk, but is definitely one of the kind of the first graph algorithms that came out as well was Nertebeck, which is which does come from uh, Wertebeck, I believe. Yeah. So that's like taking, uh, yeah, it's like you you take a, so I think Wertebeck is like you take a sentence and then. Uh, you take a window of words um, and you try to encode uh, words that kind of like happen together into a similar embedding space. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of, they've transferred that over the graphs where you run random walks over the graph and you try to find representations for nodes such that they are closer to nodes that have appeared together in random walks. So, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it does sound like there, there is interplay between the two fields. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks. So thanks again, Kevin, for that. And uh, yeah, much appreciate the, the talk. It's uh, really great to see uh, some of your experience in trying to scale graph networks. So for give a another round of applause for Kevin. Thanks. Thank you.